Hello, today's radio pharmacy snack is with regards to nuclear medicine and pharmacokinetics inside this field and how radio pharmaceuticals behave, their mechanisms of biodistribution. I absolutely love this lecture because it shows you how fantastic the technology is evolved and what all the options are that we currently offer in the clinic. It's a celebration of nuclear medicine for me. So the first method of biodistribution I want to mention is compartmentalization. The radio pharmaceutical is injected into a compartment with clear boundaries which the radio pharmaceutical cannot cross. In this instance, we look at the more morphology aspects of this compartment. Is it intact? Does it look like it should? Um, you can do blood to see if all the blood flow in the body is okay and the heart is functioning very well. You can do the inhalation of a gas to show you how the air fills the lungs and if the lungs are symmetrical and are the right size and if there's no areas of non-ventilation where the air doesn't go. Systemography is to check the central nervous system fluids and see if they are not leaking out. So you are looking at the intactness of this compartment. And a radioactive meal where they make the worst egg dish <laughs> and you have to make radioactive eggs and, and toast and then the patient eat it. And then you can see exactly how the food moves through this compartment of the gastrointestinal tract. This is just an example of a lung scan where they look at the gas distribution in the lungs to see if these lungs are healthy and if there is areas of low air perfusion. So that is a compartmental study. This is a blood flow study to show you how that looks. And then we go on to our next method of biodistribution. I'm running through this quickly. If you want me to explain some of these some more, you can add that to the comments below and I will definitely take into account your suggestions when planning my next lectures. The next one is passive diffusion, where we know it's the, a movement from molecules from a low concentration to a higher concentration across a membrane. In this case, we can look at the brain, blood-brain barriers intactness. You will get... Um, Radio pharmaceuticals with the ability to go across the blood brain barrier, but only if the patient is alive. And then you can also look at myocardial perfusion, where the um, radio pharmaceutical perfuse across the myocytes in the heart. And if they are alive, they will accumulate the radio pharmaceutical. This is called technetium systemibi scan. So they go over the myocardial cells and if it's alive, it gets um, taken up by the negative mitochondria. But if it's not alive, it just perfuses back. So it uh, has passive diffusion. There is no energy required. This is how a normal systemibi scan looks like. Um, you can see that there is... Um, the amount of radioactivity is in red, where it's high areas, and this heart is functioning okay for most of it. I see some, <laughs> someone will tell me, no, there is defects, but we're not going to go into that today. The next mechanism of biodistribution is filtration, and in these we just look at the kidneys themselves and see if they are working well. So you get, uh, you can look at glomerular filtration, tubular secretion, and tubular fixation. Um, so this is free uh, kidney agents where you can see if the filtration method works well. This is very useful in patients that get some chemotherapy or cancer treatment and you have to monitor them. You also get tubular secretion that looks at all of the mechanisms of secretion and not only glomerular filtration. And then you get fixation which looks at the morphology of the kidney. There is just an image of a kidney scan looking at filtration over time. The next mechanism is facilitated diffusion. So there must be some 
transporter involved. So there is still no energy involved, but there is now a transporter that takes the molecule over the cellular membrane. And our sh radioactive sugar molecule, FDG, is a classic example of this. It gets transported over by facilitated diffusion with the GLUT1 or 4 transporter. And then inside it um, undergoes metabolism to fix it in the cell and then you can image it. Active transport needs energy. So ATP will be used and converted to ADP. And for this, a classic example would be your sodium potassium ATPase pump. This, um, together with your sodium iodine symporter, they are used for various radiopharmaceutical investigations, some myocardial, some for the thyroid, radioactive iodine or thallium-201 are examples of radiopharmaceuticals. And there I have a thyroid scan for you, which is um, not a good thyroid. <laughs> Then you have secretion that we can monitor, so we can look at your secretory organs, inject something that is maybe more lipid-like, which, which should be excreted by the gallbladder and the liver and the pancreas you can also look at. So there is this whole secretory systems that you can evaluate over time. And here is a nice picture of the liver secreting into the gallbladder and going further. So you can see if that system is blocked or if it's not functioning well. Phagocytosis is also of interest. And there we look at the lungs, liver, bone marrow and lymph with small particles that you inject and you want to see if they behave as they should. One of them is of course the spleen as well. If you want to see if the spleen is still there after a splenectomy, you also use this mechanism. The next mechanism of biodistribution is cell sequestration. This one is actually where you look at the um, spleen. So the spleen normally accumulates damaged red blood cells. And now you want to have a look at how efficiently the spleen removes these red blood cells. But in the clinic, more often we would actually image if the spleen is still there. So patients undergo a uh, splenectomy where the spleen is removed. And now the surgeon wants to know that they remove everything of the spleen. You inject damaged red blood cells into the patient that are radio labeled and then you watch and see if they accumulate where the spleen is then you know there is some tissue left there. It's quite an interesting one, quite a more advanced technique in the radio pharmacy and I've seen uh, what well, we do about three or four a year so it's not that uncommon so it's a very interesting um, method test. Capillary blockade. Again, we return to the lungs. Now you will block all the capillaries with technetium MAA, which is particles, particulates. So you make tiny particles that will not cause adverse events, but they will block the capillary bed of the lungs so that you can see how the blood flow looks compared to the other scan where you looked at the um, ventilation or how the air fills the lungs. Now you can see where the blood flow is in the lung and if there is some clots in the lung that prevents the lung from getting blood as it should. It's also a very common procedure to do. You do a lot of these in the clinic. The next two mechanisms that I'm going to discuss with you is for bone, pain, uh, bone imaging the metabolism of bone. So you get osteoblastic and osteoclastic mechanisms of bone renewal. And these have a look at those, um, specifically osteoblastic or high bone formation tumors. Tumors which the formation of bones is in higher demand than the breakdown. So you get bone tumors or it is also when you have damage your bone and there is a high bone turnover to um, fix the, the damage and so on. Chemisorption is where we look at phosphonates and when they um, 
go stick to the bone. I still have no better way of saying that, but they adhere to the surface of the bone. So any areas where there is bone formation, there is open calcium crystals and hydroxyapatite crystals, and then these phosphonates go and adhere to those surfaces. So if you see a high amount of these radioactive biphosphonates at that area, that is a lesion. The next one is ion exchange, where the hydroxyapatite crystals, um, the hydroxy groups exchange with fluorine, much like the toothpaste that you use. And then we give radioactive fluorine that will go sit at areas of new bone turnover and be incorporated into the bone. So this is a more uh, prolonged mechanism of retention. Luckily, fluorine 18 is not radioactive anymore after a few hours because its half-life is 110 minutes. Here is just a picture of how actually dramatic this could look. So you can see all the bone metastases in these patients. Cellular migration is also of importance. Um, this is where we look at white blood cells, how they behave, red blood cells, platelets. We can label all of these cells radioactively. I will have separate lectures on that. But then you can just see if you get the method correct, you can bring that radioactive cell back into the body of the patient, still behaving like natural, and it will go where it wants to go by chemofaxes and if there is an infection it will pull it there and so forth. So you use the body's natural migratory um, aspects to image. This is an image of a white blood cell, again currently provided by Nastasha Kumbrink, which uh, shows the accumulation in an infectious, infectious prosthesis that was um, demonstrated by radioactive white blood cells that was injected back to the patient. The white blood cells were then recruited to go help in the infection, and then you see the radioactivity on the scan. Receptor binding is one of the most um, pronounced mechanisms of biodistribution currently, where um, Small molecules, peptides, antibodies, nanobodies, um, you name it. Everything that binds to receptors have compounds that are labeled and then made radioactive and then they can image the availability of these receptors and we call it that we are now imaging at pure molecular level. So it's looking at the activity of receptors in the body. For this, the best example I can give is PSMA, which is quite a well-used molecule in UK medicine. For this instance, you have a PSMA ligand that targets the prostate-specific membrane antigen. It go, binds to the PSMA receptor, the PSMA molecule. With the radioactivity, it gets internalized into the cell and it accumulates there. And then it shows you areas of prostate cancer that has spread. This is for today where I will stop. I would like you to subscribe to my channel. All the help that I can get is very much appreciated. Um, also for feedback purposes, like the video if you enjoyed it, unlike it if you feel there was something I could do better. And of course, give all your comments of where I made mistakes as as well as suggestions for future videos would be appreciated. I also want to acknowledge BioRender. All the figures you see in this presentation was drawn with this lovely program. Thank you kindly.